Hi, you guys. Thank you for joining me on today's Ask the Egg Whisperer. My name is Dr. Amy. I'm a fertility doctor coming to you from San Francisco, California. So for those of you guys who have sent me a question through asktheeggwhisperer.com, thank you so much. Thank you for being here. Thank you for sparkling. Each and every one of you that is here watching me is here because you want to bring the most amazing love into your life and you're looking for hope and that's what you're going to find here. Hope stands for have only positive. I just flicked myself in the nose and that's kind of easy when you have a nose like this. Positive expectations, but I want to change that and make it have only pragmatic expectations because a lot of fertility has to do with hope and being positive at the same time we got to be pragmatic we have to be realistic we need a roadmap and we need a diagnosis before treatment so that we have the best plans for us so the point of my show is to make sure you guys know what questions to ask of your care team to make sure you always know what's your diagnosis why am i doing this treatment what are the medications that i'm taking what are the expectations of this treatment as far as um, chances of pregnancy, and um, we're going to get to the questions now. Here we go. This first question is from Sean, and Sean is asking, are you ready? This is Sean's question. Does sex or masturbation before transfer help with implantation? Okay, so Sean, this is usually a Friday question. It's Tuesday. What I mean by that Fridays is when, you know, we get a little squirrely around here, but on Tuesdays, I can still answer this question. I get this question a lot. That's what I do. I talk about sex every day, all day long in a clinical way, in a not so clinical way. We talk about doing things like taking sex out of the bedroom and making it less work by making baby making a thing in the office, <laughs> although my office is not so sexy. So your question is a really, really good one. Um, I've had this question a lot. And what I tell people is this, sex is safe leading up to the transfer. And I always tell my patients, not to have sex after the transfer in between the transfer and your pregnancy test. Pregnancy test is eight days post-transfer. I tell people, I get it. You guys love each other. You want to have sex, but just hold off for eight days. You know, like eight days is not that long. And then with a positive pregnancy test with levels that are rising, then I give people a thumbs up, all clear to sex. The reason why I say hold off on sex is this. It's super normal to have spotting as you're waiting for, for the transfer from the transfer to your pregnancy test results. And if you have spotting and then you had sex, you're gonna somehow blame sex on something that you don't need to blame sex on. And then if it doesn't work, you're gonna never wanna have sex again. <laughs> Cause you're gonna think somehow that the sex caused you not to have a positive pregnancy test. Does sex improve pregnancy rates? The answer is probably not. Um, there has been a nice study done showing that people who didn't have sex from the transfer to their pregnancy test might have had a higher chance of pregnancy. I don't really know about that, if that's really a true thing, but I have patients that sometimes panic and they call me in the morning. <laughs> Thank God they're not calling me in the middle of the night. They're like, oh my God, Amy, I think I just had an orgasm in the middle of the night and I didn't have sex and you told me not to have sex and now I'm freaking out because I had an orgasm and I'm like, that's actually something that can happen when you're pregnant. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Okay, so you can see that I have a lot to say about this, but if you ask maybe three other doctors, three other doctors might say, well, one might say, just like me, no sex. Another one might say, thumbs up to sex. Another one might say, no sex at all, even leading up to the transfer. I had a doctor friend of mine, Dr. Catherine, she's been on my show before, and she says, no vaginal intercourse, because we don't want sperm to somehow, that fluid to get into the uterus and affect implantation. And I'm like, well, I don't know about that because, I mean, I love Catherine and we could, you know, arm wrestle and debate on this all day, but when it comes to that, people have sex all the time and get pregnant. So I'm not so sure about the embryo transfer leading up to it part. I hope that made sense. So this next question is from Tina. Tina says, hi, Dr. Amy, I'm 33 years old and I'm about to undergo my first FET. FET, for those of you who don't stands for, don't know, stands for frozen embryo transfer. I had to use a sperm donor since my husband has azospermia. Azospermia, for those of you who don't know, means no sperm. I'm going through IVF to bank embryos for our future babies. I have no fertility issues that we know of. In my previous mock ERA, there was fluid found in my uterus while on the estrogen patches. This cycle was canceled, and after 30 days of Cipro 250 milligrams BID, there was still fluid. A repeat mock cycle was done, and a biopsy of my uterine lining during my ERA showed no features of chronic endometritis, endometritis no hyperplasia, or atypia. 
The fluid itself was never aspirated for examination. I'm negative for STDs, SIS, and HSG were normal. No other issues with my uterus. I'm asymptomatic. For my transfer in November, I'm supposed to take Cipro again for two weeks. I don't understand the point in antibiotics when there's no uterine infection. Can you explain what you've done for women with this issue? Is estrogen to blame? Tina, yes. So the diagnosis is you have fluid in your cavity. The reason for it could totally be the estrogen. What I would do is I would go back to your egg retrieval cycle. Look at the ultrasounds there. Were you building fluid in your lining at that time? If the answer is no, aha, that's the way to go. Consider planning a natural cycle transfer or actually consider using maybe a lower dose of estrogen. Sometimes that can help. I also have a few tricks up my sleeve. One of them is maybe take mucinex, clear, uh, Mucinex, um, Claritin, you know, things to maybe dry out uh, uh, mucus. I've seen that work before, but I would say if you were a patient of mine, you, I basically would have done the exact same things that you've done. Rule out fluid coming down from the fallopian tubes into the uterus. Rule out the hydrosalpings like you've done. Look at the cavity, and it sounds like you've looked at that. And then really look at the protocol. So I think taking a different approach might be the way to go. And you're right. I don't know that Cipro, all that Cipro makes too much sense. So ask your doctor, say, what other protocol options do I have given that I'm making fluid on this estrogen patch? So maybe a pill, a shot, and maybe just natural cycle transfer would be the way to go. So this is a question from Nora. Hi, doctor. I'm a huge fan of your show. I'd like to thank you. Thank you, Nora. My question is related to the complications in IVF after embryo transfer and ectopic. Last month, I had IVF cycle, I had an IVF cycle done. Three embryos were transferred after um, five days from the retrieval. After 14 days, my HCG was 368. The doctor did the HCG and ultrasound after two weeks, and then I started having a really bad stomach ache and I started bleeding. I visited the hospital, let me see, and doctors performed another HCG and it was 2,268. I then did an ultrasound and found a hematoma in my uterus, and the doctor was really worried about an ectopic with a ruptured tube. I then went to emergency surgery, and sadly, I lost a left fallopian tube from a left ectopic pregnancy. Can you please educate on ectopic pregnancy? Is it common in IVF? Or some issues with my body or tubes? Will it happen again if I did IVF? And how to prevent or what precautions can I take to have, or to prevent me from having an ectopic pregnancy? So here I have a uterus, okay? So here's a uterus, and here's the middle of the uterus. And when we put embryos in, the embryo goes like this, and we put it there. And then we think of an embryo like a peanut in a crunchy peanut butter jar, right? So we hope that that peanut doesn't move. Don't move. And then there are things like embryo glue. So embryo glue is something that's marketed and I wish there was such a thing, but there really isn't. So there's no such thing as embryo glue. So what we do is we put the embryo there and we hope, fingers crossed, I tell patients, eyes, nose, fingers, toes, and ovaries crossed for you. <laughs> that would hurt though if your ovaries are crossed. And then with that embryo, what can happen is the embryo can actually float into the fallopian tube, believe it or not. That's really annoying if it can do that or if it does that. It's very rare, maybe once every two to three years, given the number of patients that I have, it happens. And um, it's very, very annoying. And in fact, the first IVF pregnancy was actually a pregnancy in the fallopian tube. And IVF was invented for young women who have blocked fallopian tubes. So it's not like unheard of for this to happen, but like I said, it's like beyond annoying. It's super, 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 super annoying of all the annoying things that can happen because you've worked so hard for these embryos and now it's not in the right place and you can't push it back into the uterus and then you can result, you know, it can result in having an emergency surgery as well. So the question is, you guys know the question, what's your diagnosis, right? Why are you doing IVF in the first place? It sounds like maybe you did IVF because you might not have known that you have a tubal issue. So if you have tubal factor, you might have a higher risk of having an ectopic pregnancy. If you have a history of a hydrocell pinks or fluid in the tube, you might have a higher risk of having an ectopic pregnancy. So super important to do this for me. Before your next transfer, take a look at the remaining tube. So you have one tube that's out of your body. So we're not worried about an ectopic on that side anymore. What about that remaining tube? So once your next period starts in about six to eight weeks after the ectopic pregnancy, check your fallopian tubes through a procedure called an HSG. 
and then ask your doctor, did you guys notice any endometriosis when you were doing the surgery on me? Um, should I be thinking that maybe we need to treat endometriosis before we do a transfer? Um, think about maybe doing another IVF cycle depending on how many embryos you have left. It sounds like you have a pretty good number of embryos from what I'm sensing from your story. So that's those are the kind of the things that I would be thinking about. And you would be at higher risk of having another ectopic if there was some tubal pathology left in that other tube that's there. Sometimes whatever is blocking the one tube that caused it to result in an ectopic can also be blocking and affecting the other one. Or it could totally just be random bad luck. And your next transfer will go just fine. But if you rule out the things that I just suggested to you, then I think you'll feel a lot better moving forward with the transfer. And then the other thing is, as soon as your HCG level goes above, let's say, a thousand, go do an early ultrasound. Take a look in your uterus. And it sounds like your doctor was super careful and cautious and looked really early with an HCG level in the 2000s and saw that there was no pregnancy in your uterus and diagnosed the ectopic. But with this next pregnancy, you wanna do the same thing but maybe be brought in even sooner. I would see you if you were my patient like around five and a half weeks of pregnancy to take a look and see and make sure that this pregnancy was in the right place for additional reassurances. So this next question is from Jennifer. Jennifer is saying, hi, Amy. Hello, Jennifer. So appreciate you doing the show and I'm confident that you helped many. I really do hope so. I'm 32, my AMH is five. My husband has male factor infertility. We did the sperm DNA testing and results came back good. It's our second IVF cycle and this time they retrieved 12 eggs, nine were mature, four fertilized with ICSI. I'm devastated. I'm wondering, what are some of the reasons that could be behind such a poor fertilization rate? Thank you so much. Okay, so first of all, you got 12 eggs and nine were mature. That's pretty good. Those are pretty good statistics. However, your AMH of five doesn't quite line up with having, having that type of cycle. So I'm wondering, did they stimulate you with less uh, medication just because of the number of eggs that you had? Could there be potentially an opportunity next time to stimulate you a little bit more aggressively knowing that you did just fine with this IVF cycle and didn't have severe ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome? So that's one, those are one of the things that I would think about. The other thing would be, it still could be an egg quality issue or just, you know, I think of going through IVF as learning experiences. You know, we think of things as failure and unsuccessful, but I like to use the word, did it work or did it not work? And what did we learn? That just feels a whole lot better to me than having someone call something a failure or unsuccessful. This, you are unsuccessful. And I'm like, God, if someone keeps telling me that I'm unsuccessful, I might start believing it. And I don't like to, you know, I really believe in the, 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 you know, that law of attraction that if you believe it, you will achieve it. So I believe that you will be successful. I really hope that these four embryos turn into blastocysts and your blast formation rate is at least 50% and you'll get two blastocysts from this cycle. But go back and look at your embryos and think about our diamonds. So remember the embryo diamonds. So ask about the quality of your embryos on the day that they were frozen or even transferred if you end up doing a transfer. Ask the doctor about the implantation rate per embryo. And then if you did genetic testing, talk about which embryos were abnormal, normal, or mosaic and get all the official reports, including the genetic report if you did genetic testing, the sperm quality report, get the report on the um, your stem sheets, like how much medication you used, and then schedule a post IVF consult with your IVF doctor and kind of go through everything. Say like, is this the same protocol you would use next time? What can I do that's in my control to improve my chances with my next IVF cycle? And then what would we do if this next cycle didn't work? I'm not counting out that this cycle was not a successful one for you, but I'm just thinking through all of these things because I feel like people go down the, I've heard patients say to me, I went down the Google rabbit hole and I'm like, stop. Don't go through, don't go down the Google rabbit hole. Join my IVF class on eggwhisperschool.com. That's way better than the Google rabbit hole. And then we can kind of talk through like, you know, what to do if an IVF cycle did not work. See, I didn't use the word unsuccessful. We'll kind of um, dissect all the things that you do if let's say you did transfer and you ended up with a pregnancy test or a, uh, a transfer that did not work. 
and uh, there's a list of questions that you can, or sheets that you can print out, take to your doctor, and kind of make sure you understand everything. So I would say, I know you're devastated. I feel the pain in the question that you asked, and I get fired up about stuff like this because now you have this incredible learning experience so that hopefully, remember hope, have only positive and pragmatic expectations this next cycle and transfer will work for you. So this next question is from Katrina, and Katrina says we've been trying for three years and just had an unsuccessful IVF transfer. One embryo, or I remember, I'm gonna change the language. I had one IVF transfer that did not work, only one embryo, and we had a low dose stem. We have unexplained infertility. My nutritionist thinks I might have an overactive immune system and my body attacks the embryo. The last few cycles, my breasts swelled and were sore and I had so many new symptoms, which made me think I was pregnant, then not. Is there a test I can do to see if I'm carrying a gene or something to attack the embryo? Okay, so let's kind of break this down, you guys. So Katrina, this is my approach. This is called the egg whisperer plan or the egg whisperer way. Number one, diagnosis. What's your diagnosis? So three years of trying to conceive and you did an IVF cycle, it sounds like you used low-dose stem and got one embryo. Could it be an egg quality issue? Could it be endometriosis? Could it be uterine factor? Talk to your doctor about that and see what you guys learned from this IVF cycle. Schedule a post-IVF consult. The likelihood of there being an embryo attack inside your uterus is really, really low. Um, I typically think of you know recurrent implantation issues. Notice I didn't say the word failure. It's hard to diagnose that based on one transfer. However, I do have situations where I'm like, yeah, if a patient is really worried about certain things, we can do some tests to see if there's inflammation in the lining, to see if you have some undiagnosed autoimmune issue. When a patient goes online and reads about certain tests, sometimes it's very satisfying to have them do the test and answer the question. And so some of the tests that you might have read about would be doing a natural killer cell panel and looking at Th1, Th2 cytokine levels to see if perhaps you'd benefit from something like intralipid infusions. There are other genetic tests that you can do looking at implantation genes. But I think nine out of 10 times, the answer is most likely or more likely than not, not associated with some sort of like attack or an, an, an immune issue um, mounted by your body. The, the, the embryos do some pretty cool things where the decidual reaction, so that's the reaction that happens when an embryo implants, kind of changes the environment and protects that little embryo, almost like in a little bubble, so that outside invaders cannot destroy that embryo. So your body is pretty smart and these embryos are pretty smart too. So I want you to like trust that because I think that if you start thinking of like this attacking stuff that someone has told you about, sometimes like it creates this fear and anxiety that a lot of times is unfounded. So let's go back to what I just said about the egg whisperer plan, right? Diagnosis. Let's talk about all the possible possibilities for you. Ask your doctor this question. We talked about this on this last show. What have you ruled out? That's a really good way of saying, like, what do we know about me? And then your doctor then will just kind of talk through what they know about you and what tests they've done and what they've ruled out by doing those tests. And then say, um, have I done enough genetic testing? Have you looked at the cavity of my uterus? Is there advanced sperm testing that we should do? Have I completed a preconception lab panel in the last six months looking at, for example, my thyroid level? And have we done recent ovarian reserve tests looking at my FSH, estradiol, AMH? Maybe we should do all of those again. And then certainly, if you feel like you want to think outside the box and go there with these extra immune tests, go for it. It's just additional costs and sometimes annoyance and IVs and blood draws. I don't see that it's that like controversial, but I also feel like sometimes we miss big picture stuff by thinking about things that are outside the box when the reality is the answer lies within the box. So diagnosis is key. Design your IVF cycle to address the diagnosis. Looking at the endometrium and doing endo, uh, sorry, <clears throat> embryo transfer preparation. For some people that includes things like doing the ERA test and doing the, <laughs> I love it when I'm thirsty and I want coffee <laughs> and there's nothing in there. 
so pardon me as I cough. <clears throat> I guess I could drink some hand sanitizer, but the likelihood of that helping me out right now is probably close to a big fat zero. So note to self when starting Ask the Egg Whisper, be sure to have coffee on hand or at least water. So Katrina, thank you for asking this question. This is a question I get from a lot of my patients as well. And I hope that my answer helps you so that you're better equipped to go into your doctor's visit and to talk through the different tests that you've had done. And if your nutritionist think that this might be a thing, ask them what testing would you do for someone in this situation and why do you think that about me? Certainly there are diseases like celiac disease that are associated with things like miscarriages and you know fixing that or you know changing your diet could certainly help, but I feel like we gotta get a better diagnosis for you, Katrina. Yes, okay. So you guys, thanks for joining today's show. I'm not done yet. I've given myself enough time now to answer your chatted questions. So I'm going to go to your live chatted questions right now. Um, someone's telling me, tell me about the HSG. I'm so scared. For those of you who don't know, the HSG checks the tubes. So that is the fallopian tube. You need to have an open fallopian tube to have a healthy pregnancy inside the uterus. Otherwise, it might be harder to get pregnant if there's one tube that's blocked or both tubes that's blocked. It's the T and the Tushy method. For those of you who have no idea what I'm talking about, go to tushymethod.com. Tushy stands for the five tests that you can do to test your fertility, tubes, uterus, sperm, hormones, and your genetics. And so the fallopian tube test is done between cycle days eight through 10. If you were my patient, I would advise you to please continue to have sex up until that visit if you want to, and then have sex after the HSG because sometimes you can get pregnant just you know in that cycle and there's no reason to hold off unless you want to. I ask all my patients to take a Valium and a Tylenol with codeine. I give them the option to do that 30 minutes before so that they don't have severe pain. Um, I find that in women, uh, we tend to uh, minimize certain medical procedures because we're women and, um, and that's not fair. So if a man had an HSG, I assure you they would all be under general anesthesia when doing it. Can I get a thumbs up? I think you guys probably all agree with me. So um, some patients are do just fine with just Motrin beforehand. And just, I also give antibiotics before and uh, the night before in the morning of, and if the fallopian tubes are open, I tell my patients to stop the doxycycline or the antibiotic that they're taking. If the fallopian tubes are blocked, I have them finish the course of antibiotics. Great question. So this next question is, um, oh, that's really sweet. Your face always gives me hope of the next round of IVF and hopefully healthy embryos. Thank you, Vienna. That is very, very sweet. I'd much rather read that than the opposite. <laughs> Hi, age 29, AMH 8.9, AFC 16, FSH 1.9. I ended up with eight eggs, two embryos. Does this seem right or does something go wrong? That seems great. I mean, I wonder about your stimulation. I wonder if maybe they purposely, because you're young, you know, dosed you a little bit lower. But I think right now with the pandemic, everyone's trying to be as gentle as possible with starting medications for patients because we don't want people to get sick. We don't want people to be in the hospital or the ERs with pain or ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So it makes perfect sense perhaps because of your age and your high follicle count that they just went a little bit lower on the stem to just try and maximize your chances without putting you at risk for anything. But oftentimes after someone goes through their first IVF cycle, we learn so much about what worked so that we can take those lessons and apply it to the next cycle. So I would definitely talk to your doctor about, will the number of embryos that I have help me reach the family size goals that I want for myself? And depending on what you learned and the quality of your embryos, I would take advantage of your youth and maybe consider doing one more cycle so that when you're, let's say, 29, you have your baby. At 32, you do it again. Two years later, you do it again. And you do it for like the next 12 years. I know that's a long time to be pregnant and having babies. But my thing is this. We got to fill this world with awesome families. And people who will do anything to have a baby, like do shots and multiple ultrasounds and undergo egg retrievals. Like, you guys really need to be the parents that are filling up this community. So that's my goal is helping every single person who reaches out and God bless you for asking the questions that you guys ask. So this is another question. What are your thoughts on acupuncture? Is it worth it? And do you go once or twice a week? So it is not worth it. If you have a needle phobia, please don't do it. 
it is totally worth it if you go and you're like, this is awesome. I love it. I feel so relaxed coming out. But if you're like, I have so much more anxiety, I just drove an hour and a half to get here, I can barely afford what I'm doing already, and now I'm basically working a second job just to also afford the acupuncture, eh, no to the acupuncture. My patients who do it, they say they love it. It makes them feel so good as they're going through their IBS cycle. They also have a really good experience in pregnancy with acupuncture. They have less nausea, less vomiting, less joint pain. They have a much easier first trimester and beyond. So lots of benefits for acupuncture, including decreasing nausea in the first trimester, and also physical rec recovery after an egg retrieval seems to be better as well. Uh, here's another question. Is it possible for strong seasonal allergies and asthma to impact the immune system and cause miscarriage? I don't know, I don't, I don't think so. I don't, I don't see an association between seasonal allergies and miscarriage. Thank you for that question. Let's see here. Let's see if you guys have any other questions before I sign off. How do you determine whether to do the Ganorelex or Cetratide versus Microdose Lupron? My first IVF cycle resulted in three embryos that stopped growing, and now my doctor is wanting to do a Microdose Lupron protocol. Okay, Felicia, this is a great question. I just feel like when it comes to IVF, when something doesn't work, we like to learn from that experience and sometimes we like to adjust protocols and do something a little bit different. So there are really only a hand, well, there's maybe like five different ways of doing things. There's like birth control pill start, natural cycle start, S-trace priming, S-trace and testosterone priming, long Lupron protocol, short Lupron protocol, microdose Lupron protocol, antagonist cycle, mini IVF. I just listed all the different ways that you can do IVF and I'm still not done. We have luteal phase start and we have duo stem. I don't think I missed anything. If you guys think I did, let me know. But at the end of the day, your doctor is trying to be creative. And I would say that I, I do have success with microdose Lupron protocols. I feel like Ganarelic cycles are just better in my hands. And so that's why I prefer those types of cycles. But if your doctor thinks that doing a microdose flare is something that they're really excited about to try with you, I would say go for it without hesitation. This next cycle is from Joyce. She's asking, for the natural frozen embryo transfer, what is your favorite values of estrogen, progesterone, and lining just before the transfer? Awesome. So for a natural frozen cycle, I am super, super picky, like so annoyingly picky, it's nuts. First of all, I like the progesterone to be less than 0.5 or at least around 0.5, and I wanna be the one to induce ovulation with a trigger shot. Why? Because then I will go to sleep at night knowing that I timed the transfer perfectly. And um, so I like to do follicle checks. I have the patient monitor OPK, which is ovulation predictor kits. And then if it looks like they're getting positive or getting close, I'm like, come on in and we'll do your first follicle scan. I look at the size of the follicle. I check hormone levels. I hand the patient the ovidrol, which is the trigger shot. And then I tell them exactly when to take it. And then we know exactly when the transfer is gonna fall, usually seven days later. And the estrogen level that I'm looking for is around 100 to 150 at least. And sometimes I have patients take Femera too, because the benefit of adding a fertility pill like Femera is you might get two eggs ovulated, so that's more progesterone secreted and less progesterone you have to take in the end. So here's a great question. Can luteal phase estrogen priming delay the period start? And the answer is yes, depending on the dose that you use. This question's from Sarah. Any tips for having a blocked fallopian tube and endometriosis? Absolutely. If you have endometriosis and also maybe it's causing the blocked fallopian tube, you might want to look at doing the receptiva test to see how much inflammation there is and whether you should treat medically, surgically, or both. Meaning if your fallopian tube is blocked before putting an embryo in your uterus, perhaps removing that tube could help increase your implantation rate. And then I would also really you know, if you haven't done IVF already, we know that endometriosis can affect egg quality. I consider embryo, uh, endometriosis a fertility threatening condition. And I know that like all doctors do, uh, well, fertility doctors, I should say, but I feel like the word's not out there. Like we haven't told patients truly how damaging endometriosis can be for some women. So if you're out there listening to this and you've been told you have endometriosis, you're a great candidate to talk to a fertility doctor, to talk about your family size goals, your fertility hormone levels, and whether you should do egg freezing, embryo freezing, or both. 
because we know we don't age backwards. We know endometriosis can get worse over time. And there's a little bit of something called a catch-22. And what I mean by that is sometimes you tell patients, oh, you have endometriosis. You should get pregnant. It'll treat it. But you're like, huh? Don't you understand? I'm a fertility patient. I need your help for me to get pregnant. So that's what we're here for. We're here to help you guys. So go see one of us. This question is from Amanda. I had two embryos transferred October 1st. I took a test this morning and was positive. I'm having period-like cramping and back pain. Is this normal? I'm currently five days post, five-day transfer. I had a biochemical last time, so I'm scared. Okay, Amanda, this is what I tell patients. Having that feeling like really low deep in, the, in your lower back and deep down in your pelvis, like your period is going to start at any moment, but it doesn't start is basically one of the first early signs, signs and symptoms, <laughs> signs and symptoms, and I just made those words up, of early pregnancy. But at the same time, it can be anything. It could also be your period might be coming soon. We know that's not happening for you because you have a positive pregnancy test. So I hope that this pregnancy test continues to rise and the levels are amazing and awesome and wonderful and you have the healthiest of pregnancies and you'll live happily ever after. And uh, I hope you update us next time. So this question is from Nath. Hello, had a fresh chance for today. Is it recommended to take baby aspirin? I do recommend to my patients, <laughs> that sounded really weird. Yes, I recommend patients take baby aspirin. Um, for a lot of reasons, but I know a lot of doctors don't, but I do. And just because I do doesn't mean that you have to. So talk to your doctor about it. Just be like, hey, is there anything in your history that you would think that maybe like taking aspirin would help me with? So in general, we know that aspirin might decrease the risk of a condition called preeclampsia, which is the most common uh, risk factor for hypertension in pregnancy. And it can also cause preterm labor and preterm birth as well as like maternal like badness. So taking aspirin, and sometimes I recommend taking it through 34 to 37 weeks of pregnancy, especially for women who have a BMI over 30, have a twin pregnancy, um, are pregnant for the first time over the age of 40, have a previous history of preeclampsia. There's a whole like table that you can look up to see, am I a candidate for aspirin in pregnancy, especially after IVF? So talk to your doctor about that and see what they think. So this question is from Isabel. I started IVF stims today. However, estradiol on day two is 108. Should I be concerned that we start the cycle with that estradiol level? Isabel, it's a great question for your doctor. And the reason is maybe they saw a follicle on your ovary and maybe your progesterone level was a little bit high too. So perhaps in their mind, they're saying, ah, she's just coming down with her ovulation and we're gonna be just okay. So it's possible that they saw that and also missed it. And you're like, holy smokes, I could be ovulating really quickly this cycle and I'm just wasting my medications. So call them up and see, what do you guys think? Should I be starting my stems as planned? And I almost said sharding. <laughs> I uh, actually said that today to somebody on accident. Okay, I'm 36 years old, trying for three years. FSH is seven, LH is five, progesterone is 0.4, prolactin is 10.8 and AMH is 2.6. Okay, cool. Oh, she said my question and she put a hand in front of her face. Oh, uh, are these numbers good? I have uterine polyps and normal sperm. And the answer, those numbers are really, really good. So if you've been trying for three years, let's put poly the polyp in a polyp jar. And uh, if you don't have already one child at home, consider doing IVF to preserve your future options so that you can have two kids and you'll never look back and be like, Oh, why didn't I freeze my embryos while I still had healthy eggs at 36? So I would definitely consider doing that. This question is from Ash. Ash is saying, hello, I'm so scared of the egg retrieval and getting OHSS. I have an AMH of 10.6. My tubes were open and now my right tube supposedly is blocked as of last Tuesday. Okay, you have every reason to be scared of OHSS. So my thoughts are get seen early in your cycle meaning frequent and often. Actually, I should change that up. I wish I could come up. I'm trying to come up with a mnemonic here for patients who are at high risk of OHSS and it should be um, early, <laughs> often and frequent. I can't do it, you guys. Clearly, I need a little bit more time on my hands to come up with these mnemonics because right now it's just not working. So um, start your medications at a lower dose Make sure you have emergency numbers for the clinic so that if you need something in a pinch, someone's gonna answer you right away rather than making you wait two weeks. 
Um, consider having electrolyte rich drinks on hand already like Gatorade, Propel, G2, Powerade, coconut water. Maybe get something like Drip Drop. Those are powder packs full of electrolytes and you just pour it in your water, stir it up and drink it. I also recommend to my patients to get whey protein, 20 grams, starting at one to two times per day, leading up to the retrieval. After retrieval, going up to three to four times per day until you feel better or your period starts, whichever comes first. And most of the time when your period starts, you're feeling a heck of a lot better. And there are several different medications that we use at the time of trigger that can help decrease the risk of severe OHSS or even moderate OHSS. So that's HESPAN, so that's IV fluid hydration on the day of the egg retrieval. Femera and bromocryptine can also help. Ganarelix can even help after the egg retrieval. And you're like, what? Stim's over, why am I still taking shots? Well, that can also help with hyperstimulation. So those are the different sorts of things that I do so that I don't have to worry about my patients getting sick, going to the hospital, and going through a lot of the things that can be considered complications of IVF treatment. So this is a great question. Can six months on Orlissa make your ovaries oversuppressed? Two IVF cycles after laparoscopy and both cycles, I've been a poor responder. Okay, so this is what I'm thinking. It's not the Orlissa. You had laparoscopy. So potentially they actually did surgery to remove some endometriomas and maybe some healthy eggs went with them. So check another AMH and see what's going on. I can tell you a story. I had a patient who I put on Depo-Lupron after laparoscopy. Her AMH was 0.1. And I was like, oh my God, I cannot believe it. This over. We'll never be able to get healthy eggs again. Six months later, her AMH was over one and I got her two healthy embryos in her next IVF cycle. So the answer to your question is absolutely yes. You can for sure be over suppressed from the Orlissa. Everyone's body is different. It just might take a little bit of time to get your ovaries to wake up. But at the same time, look at that operative report and see what did they remove at the time of your laparoscopy. And potentially the surgery might have been the risk factor that's causing what's going on to happen. So find out a little bit more. And then also ask your doctor what supplements you should be taking to maybe prevent the progression of endometriosis. In my patients, I talk to them about taking N-acetylcysteine. And that's something that's been shown in not just one, not just two, in many studies to potentially prevent the progression of endometriosis. So this is a question about genetic carrier screening. Where do you recommend getting it done? So I draw blood in my office and there are several different companies that do genetic carrier screening and I have their kits here. And typically when a patient comes in to get their tushy checked or comes in for their expedited ultrasound after their new patient video call, um, they'll come in for a blood draw and I'll draw their blood for the carrier screen. Alternatively, the other option is for us to ship kits out to you, to your home. But sometimes when things get shipped out, people just use them as doorstops and they forget to actually spin the tube and that's totally understandable. And who wants to deal with all the shipping and handling stuff at home? When you come here, you just pop into the blood draw chair, I draw your blood and then we ship it out for you. So sometimes that's a little bit easier. So this question is, I'm 43 years old, two kids, previous marriage, all my tests were normal, my AMH is one, I got pregnant twice in 2018, pregnancy miscarried, I had one ectopic pregnancy last year, any hope, Husband has normal sperm, any hope with IVF or IUI? So my answer to you is at 43, even with an AMH of one, chances are low, but not no. If you were a patient here, I would be like, so what are you doing tomorrow? Come on over. Let's take a look at your ovaries and let's plan your IVF cycle and let's do IVF right away. Because at 43, chances are about like, you know, depending on your AMH and what we see on your ovaries, you know, maybe about, I don't want to overpromise, but maybe like, 7% for some people, but then when you get to 44, it's more like 4%, 45, it's more like 2%. So just whatever you can do right now, I would just sh say, show up for it and go do it and take your CoQ10. So here's a question from Living Good. Our first IVF cycle failed and our doctor is suggesting we try again, but doesn't want to change anything our second go around. Do you usually suggest adjustments? Okay, so let's just say this. Ask your doctor, what did we learn from our IVF cycle? Did we learn anything more about my diagnosis? You know, and then you can also ask, why did you choose the medications you cho chose and why wouldn't you do anything differently? So I think those are very, very fair questions to ask. I'll tell you, sometimes I don't do anything different at all when I get beautiful blastocysts. They're just gorgeous, but they're just not genetically normal. And you're just like, ah, and I know that it had nothing to do with the protocol, right? 
Um, and so sometimes in cases like that, it totally makes sense to do the same thing again. But if you were unhappy with, let's say, the egg maturity or the fertilization rate or the embryo progression rate, sometimes it makes sense to do things a little bit differently. At the beginning of this show, or not that long ago, I kind of ran through all the different protocols that are out there. So perhaps ask your doctor, say, you know what, I don't feel comfortable doing the exact same thing again. Just humor me. Can we just try something different that you feel comfortable with? And then if your doctor says no, then I would say there's a good reason maybe they're saying that and maybe learn from them and see what that reason is. And if you still don't feel comfortable with it, I would say maybe getting a second opinion would help so you feel more equipped as to whether you should be moving forward in this cycle or not. Here's a great question about PIO. So PIO stands for pain in the, no, I'm just kidding, stands for progesterone in oil. So these are the shots, and she says, I'm terrified of needles. I don't even know how I made it through stem shots. So the answer is the alternative is yes, there's vaginal inserts. So I tell patients, you skip one, whatever you're doing is done. I don't like to say your pregnancy is done because that can be a little bit triggering, but honestly, you gotta be sticking to a schedule and never skip a single one. So medications like endometrin or crinone, I prefer endometrin. So I tell patients to do their endometrin suppositories eight, two, and eight, and never let more than 12 hours pass between their last one of the day and their first one of the morning. So don't be that person that's like, ah, I'm gonna sleep in and then do my first insert 11 when my last insert was eight. How do you think that pregnancy is supposed to get progesterone? Endometrin is not an oil, there's no buildup. So you have to do it, you know, at a very, very consistent time every single day. And I tell patients there's no such thing as too much. So if you think you might be sleeping in the next day, just do one late at night the night before and set an alarm for the next day if, if let's say you're worried that you might sleep in. And the other thing is have an extra one in your purse, in your car, um, in, at work. And the reason is sometimes one will fall out. So if it fell out, if you literally saw it fall out, then put another one in. And the other thing with the insert is sex. So if you're having sex, that can affect absorption. So someone asked me, that was a, one of the first questions in the show is like, do I recommend sex before transfer? And the answer is I do, except if you're using endometrin, because you're going to have to place more endometrin after sex, because I don't know of any studies that have looked at absorption with ejaculation. And so that's just one thing that I would say, no, 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 don't do that. Okay. Or place another one afterwards. So this question is, I'm 34 years old, my AMH is 0.9, I have possible endometriosis, do you recommend HGH? And the answer is yes, I would recommend HGH during STEM and with the details that you just shared with me, at least we would talk about it. So here's a question from Jasmine, can anything other than injections be used for IVF? I've heard of Cineral nasal spray being used, but not sure if it's used here in California, if it's as effective. This is defined alternatives for shots. Jasmine, I wish. So this is the thing. Cineril prevents ovulation, so it's a medication that would potentially replace the need for a medication, for example, like Lupron or Generalix or Cetratide, but you still got to grow eggs. So for patients who are super scared of injections, I get it. There's something called the Buzzy Bee. It's a really cute little thing. It's like this thing that like cools your skin and then it vibrates, and then you can give your shot and not feel it. There's also stuff that you can put on your skin that prevents you from feeling anything. Um, and then also you can actually come into the clinic, at least if you were a patient here, and I would do your shot for you every single day. I have patients who literally come here every day for 10 days and I do their shots and they're like, oh my God, I would never have been able to get through my IBS cycle had you not done my shot every single day. So this is something that I provide and this is something that your clinic might provide. And this way you can get through your cycle without the fear and you can actually maximize your chances by getting more eggs if you have more. You know my saying, it less is more, if you have less than, wait, wait, so wait, more is always more unless you have less than less is more. <laughs> Hi, let's see. The next question is, do you recommend NIPT even if PGTA embryo uh, was normal? So what that means is if you've done IVF with genetic testing, should you still do the non-invasive prenatal diagnostic test, which is a blood test done at nine weeks of pregnancy to see if a pregnancy screens normal. It is not a diagnostic test. It's still just a screening test. And my answer is I usually don't. I tell patients you've already done this testing ahead of time, but that's my style. So talk to your doctor about it. I feel like doing the ultrasounds, they're really helpful to see if there's anything abnormal seen on ultrasound. Then I would say do more diagnostic testing, like perhaps an amniocentesis, but sometimes you can get false positives from the NIPT that can be just so anxiety provoking, but I have patients that just wanna do it because it's just another test that can continue to reassure them that everything is just fine. 
I have never had a patient do IVF with PGTA and then get an abnormal NIPT that was accurate. I've had two patients have abnormal uh, NIPTs and I'm like, it's a false positive. And I was right. They then, then did another NIPT, for example, with a different company and those results came back perfectly fine or they did an amniocentesis and that came back perfectly fine. They delivered healthy babies. Someone is saying mahalo. Thank you so much, mahalo. So is Taro still being okay if I have endometriomas? And the answer is yes. I do recommend 150 milligrams per day. Once pregnant, do you recommend weaning off meds or stopping cold turkey? So I recommend stopping cold turkey unless it causes you anxiety, then I would say let's wean and I make a weaning calendar for you. So it's not a one size fits all answer. Every patient is different. Everyone has their own unique set of insecurities and anxieties based on the experience they've had leading them up to that pregnancy. And I totally understand and get it. I have patients that want to check their progesterone once a week. I have patients that want to continue their medications through 14 weeks. I have patients that are so excited to be done at 10 weeks. And I'm like, either one you choose is totally fine. Okay, so here's a question. My doctor suggests using crinone only for my natural cycle frozen embryo transfer without progesterone oil. What's your opinion? I've done so many cycles of crinone only that have worked out really well. But if you're concerned that that's not enough for you, then listen to your uterus, <laughs> listen to your ovaries, listen to your whatever is telling you that that's not enough. And maybe ask your doctor for like a progesterone shot every two days, every other day on top of the crinone. That way you feel really good that you're getting enough progesterone. Alternatively, you can check your progesterone with your crinone, see where you're at. My experience tells me that if my progesterone level in the patient is over eight with vaginal administration, then I feel really good that this is the way to go, that it's still a good um, mode of administration for them. Okay, so someone's saying, Dr. Amy, what should I do with insomnia while on stents? Should I take melatonin? Also, should I stop coffee to get better embryos? So what I would say is if you're having insomnia, make sure you're not drinking coffee past a certain time every day and maybe reduce the amount of caffeine that you're drinking. Melatonin um, is something that I tell my patients they can absolutely take during stimulation and estrogen rises in our body can also cause insomnia and anxiety causes insomnia as well. So I would look at Josephine at Lurie. So Josephine was on my show this past weekend. We did an IG live and I recorded a podcast episode with her too. And she does this amazing workshop called Empower Your Fertility. So it's a workshop that she teaches you guys skill set skills for helping to deal with anxiety and stress to bring you to a, a place of serenity as you're going through these challenges as fertility patients. And one of the things she teaches are breathing exercises. So sometimes with insomnia, it could be a sign that you're very anxious. So figuring out good breathing exercises for yourself as you're feeling that way can be truly so helpful, not just for what you're going through right now, but just in life in general. I'm so surprised all the time when I, let's say, talk to people and say, have you ever taken a formal meditation class? And uh, I would say maybe like 10% of people are saying yes, but I'm hoping that that's going to change. And over 50% of people will say yes. And you guys will sign up for one of Josephine's one-on-one um, -on -one or uh, group classes. So someone's saying sunny side up in New York. I'm triggering with DOR. I'm 32 weeks, uh, sorry, I'm 32 years old, currently seeing about eight follicles. Would you recommend two Ovidril or add Lupron to the mix? Hi, sunny side up. I think it just really depends on what your doctor thinks is best for you. Typically, if you're a patient of mine and you had eight follicles, I would look at your body size, the size of the follicles, your hormone levels, and then I would decide whether I should do a uh, two Ovidrils. Typically, I would probably trigger with 10,000 units, which is the amount that's in two Ovidrils. And then sometimes I've been known to include Lupron as well. There are a lot of different reasons that that might help or really not help and just be more expensive, um, another medication for you to take that might not have as much benefit. But those are good questions to ask. And I would say I'm super excited that you're triggering today. I hope that your eggs will sparkle on Thursday and everything's going to go really smoothly for you and your physical recovery is going to be really good. This question is from Jasmine. Is gender selection IVF the only way to have your gender of choice? There's no way to pick out certain gender sperm and do IUI with it. That's true, Jasmine. IVF is the only way. We present patients with their embryos, telling them which one's a male or female, and then you guys can choose which one you want to transfer. That's how I practice. I know a lot of doctors don't there are some clinics that don't allow patients to do that. There are some clinics that don't share the gender information, but that's not my style. This question is about starting stim on day three with letrozole, follow stim menopure. Day six scan shows nine follicles less than 10 millimeters. 
Um, does it mean they're not responding? So I would say it also kind of depends on how you started your cycle. For example, if you were priming with estrogen or you start with birth control pills, it could be that your ovaries are still a little suppressed. On day six though, the follicle sizes that you're sharing with me are actually pretty decent. So I wouldn't give up too soon or too early. I would say keep going and maybe wait another couple days and see what kind of growth you get before you make a decision as to whether this is a good cycle or not. Okay, my friends. I answered all your live chatted questions. I got to a good number of email questions and it's not midnight and I haven't been here for two hours. <laughs> Although I totally would. I would totally do an ask, ask the egg whisper marathon in like a heartbeat. If someone was like Amy on PBS, would you do an ask the egg whisper marathon? I'd be like, sign me up. But next time I'm going to have my coffee mug and I'm going to make sure that it's full of coffee so that I'm not thinking about drinking my hand sanitizer. <laughs> So thank you guys for joining me today. I love each and every one of you truly. And I really hope that you guys are all wildly successful and achieve all of your goals and reach your dreams. Remember to always check in about your mental health. Ask yourself, am I okay? Look at your partner, are you okay? If you're not partnered, look in the mirror, am I okay? And then be sure to reach out for support. There's such a huge community out there. There's fertility rally. There's resolve. There's my Instagram page. There's so many ways to find support right now. None of us are alone. You should not feel alone. There's so many people sharing their journeys more than ever right now. And there is such a huge benefit to talking through what you're going through, whether you're just posting and creating an anonymous Instagram, just so you can share what you're going through without worrying that anyone is going to judge you. And I promise you that no one's going to judge you. People are just going to love you even more for talking about what you're going through. So you would be surprised. One of the things that my patients say now, having, let's say, gone through fertility treatment five years ago, they're like, wow, Amy, I wish I had people to talk through as I was going through my journey. I wish that things were the way they are now back then, because I would have been so much better as a person coming out of it. You know what I mean? Less trauma, less PTSD, less depression, less anxiety. So please share, keep sharing, keep talking, keep celebrating, keep laughing, keep crying. It's okay. Because at the end of the day, everything is always going to be okay. Because there's no other option. Okay, I'm done lecturing you guys. Continue to have hope. Have only positive and pragmatic expectations. That's my mnemonic for today. Love you guys, and I'll see you guys next time. Bye.